Hello. It's uh, six years since I've been in these hallowed places and uh, I have a, a little pile of treats for you. Um, if you feel it's a bit stuffy in here, I, I can't help that, but we have opened some doors. I think it might be better than it, it, it has been. Okay, I'll make a start. I've got to switch this on. Mm. Um, that's an, there'll be some nice landscape pictures on this. I decided to make them full size and make the writing fit, fit inside the photographs. So let's make a start, shall we? We've had, just had a, a lot about temples and union and, and things, but what I want to get right into is the idea that if we, we're not beating a new model of Stonehenge into the archaeological world, we have to find new evidence continuously and dr dump it on their doorstep so that basically there's a lot more evidence to be taken into account. That's what I do. And so basically, let's move on to the slide one. There are, these are the three questions that the media people that are always are wanting to hassle me but never do a documentary want to know. What was the original purpose of Stonehenge? Despite centuries of archaeological endeavour, that central purpose is still not completely uh, clear. Uh, that's a, it's a big question. Nice photograph, yeah? Yeah, okay. It's sort of very sky, isn't it? We'll have a bit of landscape later. This is another question is, what was the original purpose of Stonehenge? The list I have here is a temple, astronomical observatory, geodetic marker, huge clock, repository of ancient wisdom, some or all of the above. And none of those, although they, I think to me they're perfectly reasonable to at least consider them, none of those are even considered by uh, the orthodoxy. What was the reason for fetching over 83, is the number they give, blue stones from the, the megaliths, little megaliths, from the Priscelli region of, of West Wales. This is where I live. Again, a, qu a question that is being answered and is being tackled by Mike Parker Pearson and a group of geologists and geophysicists and, and, and other, other worthy souls. We start off with a quote from John Michel because it, it sort of stops us having any hubris about Stonehenge and sets the tempo for the lecture. It was the Reverend William Stukeley who in 1740 opened our subject by noting the fact that the axis of Stonehenge and the avenue leading from it are directed to the northeast, whereabouts the sun rises when the days are longest. Thus, at the big, very beginning of archaeology, in the work of one of its earliest professors, is introduced the idea of an astronomical dimension in the setting of prehistoric monuments. So it's to do with location, alignment, and it reminds us that right at the very beginning of archaeology, someone did actually know that the avenue was on that axis, or had been on that axis. Now, it may have been a lucky guess, but at least it, was, it sets the scene for an understanding of Stonehenge, because somebody knew about that, and they aligned it to it. And we know little about that somebody, but howling barbarians, apparently they are not. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, it's a terrible place where I work. It's just horrible. It's just <laughs> suffering from a lack of, de a lack of industrial development. Um, and I have a very lonely life traipsing around with that great big heavier light. And um, this is where I work. And the, those hills in the background are the Priscelli Hills. And over to the left, we've got the Bluestone site. The top of the Priscelli's, Cum Kerwin is the middle point there. And then the sweeping curve on the right-hand side is the uh, conical volcano, the extinct volcano, fortunately, of Carningley Peak. And that dolmen is Lechadribeth, which is one of the coastal dolmens on the coastal ridge. A high land right adjacent to the sea. Not a bad place to live and work, really. And so right at the centre of the Priscelli world, as we're going to see in this lecture, is a, a monument that's only recently been categorised as other than a Bronze Age or an Iron Age uh, encampment. Uh, if they had ever, ever read Alexander Tom, they would have seen this shape uh, being a type 1 egg or a variant of it with, an ellipt with elliptical ends. We'll come on to the shape later. But what I want to bring to you is if you notice the re radial field boundaries, this is stands right on the middle 
of summit of a hill right in the middle of the Priscellis. And the radial lines are just the fields coming up to the top. So this is a very flat space. Let's have a look at that. Now, I want you to be aware of the fact that the shape of the Priscellis is uh, a bit like um, a bag on its side. It's like the coastal ridge at the top of the slide there is, includes uh, a couple of, of dolmens, uh, Lekadribeth, which means big slab with on a tripod, basically, in Welsh, um, is very, very much uh, a, a major monument in the area. So is Carningley Peak. It's considered to be the Mountain of Angels, although Ingley in Welsh is nothing to do with angels. It's, it's probably Carnongley, which is Cairn of Angles, but we'll come on to that too. And then along the main Priscelli Ridge at the bottom, we've got Af the Vreni Vau, which is the over to the right there, which is, means the sort of big figurehead. It's the monument at the leading edge of the main range of the Priscellis. It's, it's high, it's over a thousand feet. And then we come to Voildragan, which means bald hill of three cairns. Welsh is very colourful in pronunciation, but very uh, pragmatic in its interpretation. Uh, and that's, we'll, sh we'll see, we'll visit all these in a minute. And then we go along the Priscelli Ridge past a place called Voil Vedai, which we're going to find. That means the bare hill of, uh, the, of graves. And then we come to Carn Erir and up to Carn Ingley Ridge and the River Nevin at Newport. And then uh, the high ground, there's uh, two river valleys forking through here. And then back to high ground and the coastal ridge, which is about 630 feet above sea level. This lot here goes up to just about um, uh, to 1,700 feet. So, I mean, these are not, these are not mountains. They're called mountains, Minith Priscelli, but they're basically hills. Let's have a look at the monument itself in the middle there. Castell Mauer. It, big castle is what it means. So it's not prosaic, is it? It's a big castle or a big, a big fort. That's the top of it. You could fit in the news, they always say you could fit something the size of Wales on this iceberg. But this, you could definitely fit most of Glastonbury on it. It's 500 feet by 400 feet, most, and it's a, fl it's a flat area right on the top of the summit, surrounded by a, a very deep ditch, rather like um, the stones of Braga in Scotland. Um, we've got Carn Ingley there, that's the volcano. I've got a, a laser here. So let's try, see, do, and that's Dinas Island over there. And then the coastal ridge, you can just see starting to form over there. But this, and there's the, the outskirts of the ditch and bank around the monument. Now, the, that's up to nine foot deep, they, uh, perhaps a bit more than nine foot deep, but it's been silted up rather like Avebury has. And this is a chronic problem with um, a country that has so much rain, is that things silt up. And, and it has been investigated archaeologically, but the bank there rises about f five or six feet above the level of the flat plateau. And then we've got this shape, which is like a, a strange oval shape. So I decided to get to know the owner. We had been up uh, in a part of a group that walked the landscape, and my wife is a member of a, a sort of earth healing group. And we went up in 2006 or seven uh, with permission and uh, I thought then one, uh, there would be a lunar uh, solar alignment to the midwinter sunrise, and we'll come on to that too. But I decided to, to ask permission formally, and in March 2016, after a terrible winter, well, it was as wet as anything and nearly as bad as this one, I undertook uh, with a theodolite survey, and, and there's a, a rather uh, sort of awed uh, person about to start that, sartorially elegant. Um, I'd just been to see my tailor, actually, just before we went out there. And uh, all the debris that goes with the work I do, tapes and chains and things, and the, the thing that I get arrested for at airports that they think is a bomb, which holds the theodolite top. And then the rocket launcher, which is actually a tripod. It's amazing how people project onto objects they don't know when they're all folded up. So twice I've been sort of spoken to by policemen for carrying a rocket launcher. Um, <laughs> In the background there, and the, behind me, that, that is the Priscelli 
the main selling site of Carn Many, where so many of the better quality spotted do uh, dolerite stones come from. Uh, this is Carn Alu, which is a, um, a sort of equestrian nightmare with a, sh a, chev chev a, 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 a set of uh, armed defences against uh, invasion by horse or people. And then we'll come and identify the other outcrops later. But there's Voildrigan, and we need to have a look at him or her. W winter was so awful that we couldn't get the foot. We have a, a little Daihatsu 4x4. We couldn't get it up to the farm to get across to the monument because it, the path had been washed away. And so on midwinter morning, uh, we, it, we thought it would never, the sun would never break, but it suddenly did, which meant we had to make a lightning dash to the site and to catch the sun rising, having uh, out of the top of Royal Dragan, which is this conical shaped mountain at the head of the Priscellis. There's Renivaur over there, that's the figurehead. So we're looking uh, uh, sort of from south from, or south east from, uh, from this gate, and you can see the state of the field there. Um, that, so there's, that was the, what I wanted to do, was to establish this midwinter sunrise. So, time to wait till Easter for the good weather to come, <laughs> and uh, start to look at what theoretical calculations that are now to go back to 3,500 BC, which is the time period I've come to recognise in the Priscelli is a good place to start for many of, most of the monuments. And so, I go up there and we do, you do all the preliminary work. There's the three cairns seen from above. This is very like, in, in many ways, a bit like Glastonbury Tor. You've got, can you see the, the rhythm of a sort of, it's not a spiral, but you can see a, a pattern of ridges and things in the, being cut into the mountain when it was a fort, apparently. And we don't know what its purpose was, but it's very similar to, uh, it was considered to be an Iron Age fort, but the cairns on the top are Neolithic, and or um, well the, Summit was obviously used earlier than that. We'll, we'll show you why in a minute. This okay? <coughs> nice pictures? Good, right. So that's the theoretical thing from the theodolite. First of all, you measure in various parts along the slope. You put them in the bag, forget about them, go home, and you then calculate from the program. This is the elevation and the, the angle across the whole sweep of that mountain, uh, in, that's the, the angle there in azimuth it's called, and it's about 135 degrees at the top, which is sort of east of south, and that's the midwinter sun, su sunrise at, in 3500, and I've drawn the sun on, although I'd, at that stage I had no way of having um, proved it, but I, I went and carried on measuring all these angles at upright, the elevation angles, because the higher a thing is, the later the sun rises, and so this greatly affects on a, on a mountainous countryside when the, the time span over which sunrises can take place and, and sunsets. So there we, we, did this, we did the theoretical and then put it together and the sun was marked on as a result of running a programme I have that calculates it when you put in the refraction, the elevation, uh, the date, the uh, obliquity of the ecliptic as our friend Simon get fed you with this morning. Um, and that's the result. So. I'm saying, well, look, this is the foreground here, is the actual gorse that grows at the top of the bank around the monument. So we're looking out at the monument and we're seeing that that's where the sun sat at rising. It's a pretty spectacular sunrise, yes? Right. Is that a coincidence? So you go on from there. So I established that happily for myself that this was a good hot candidate to be a midwinter solstice sunrise. I also, at the same time, had been undertaking the measurements required to produce a plan of this site, something which no one had ever done. It's actually formed by two back-to-back -back equilateral triangles. You can see them there. That's the inner triangles there. And they, where they, these two points meet are the two foci, or focuses, of the um, ellipse that this shape is here. To make this shape, you have a, 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 rope, a looped rope so, which is this triangle here, and you, you double it up around back, back there to make another triangle, and then you put a marker there, walk it round, and it'll trace that shape, and of course if you carry on and you avoid that peg there, it'll, it'll make a, 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 a symmetrical mirror shape 
to define an ellipse round there. But what's most interesting of all is that this, these two points here define the radius of that curve there. If you put a haul a rope from that one, the bottom one there, and set it at this point top of the ellipse, it will then trace this one until it hits a peg there when it will wang round that corner there. It's a technical term. You don't need to, if you're not <laughs> complete, completely au fait with technical language used here, then wang will do finally. And then the other one is you go over to that one and repeat the process and produce the symmetrical opposite of that and it wangs around that peg, the rope, and it's a much smaller radius so you get the curve at the end. Now that's the best I can do. The ditch is, to the middle of the ditch is hard to determine and there is some give in it, but I did that and it's about, it's just over 500 feet there and about 493 feet there. So it's very nearly um, over square. I think it's written here, 483, the major axis is 497, it's just under 500, and the minor axis, that's that one, is 483. And, it's, uh, and I did the focal distances, 241.8 feet. These are, I work in feet because then I have an old theodolite and I'm used to feet, I can work in any unit you like. You can test me on that any time you like, but I'm happy with millimetres, centimetres, remens, royal cubits, megalithic yards, pygmies, paces, steps, and some really long lengths like chains, furlongs, miles, poles, perches, and Brexits. <laughs> That's, it's one Brexit is the width across the narrowest point of the English Channel. <laughs> right. That got a good laugh, didn't it, Mr. Soundman? Yes. Right, so let's go back to our picture. Uh, we want to now start looking at what the, what's going on here. So the, the first thing you do is, is that you go on Google Earth, which is the miracle tool of this century for people doing this sort of work. It is as a roughing out tool for establishing ideas and working with, uh, you have a, uh, this is a, this midwinter alignment. What is the two red blobs from Castlemouth to Voildrig on how far, what is the distance of it? Now, I did it on the map with the old-fashioned way, but the problem is that Google Earth uses a different model slightly of the Earth than the Ordnance Survey maps do. And most people haven't got a clue what the difference is, but it's minute. So it's still worth using Google Earth as a quick, ready reckoner to establish distance. And if you blow the size of the landscape up so that you get really near to it, you can position on various parts of that geometry I've just shown you, and you can go on the third middle cairn of Voildragan to within a foot or two. Now, we don't need to worry about a foot or two over tens of thousands of feet. The beauty of this sort of work compared to measuring Stonehenge is that over Stonehenge, a couple of inches over, say, 30 feet is quite a big difference, enough for an archaeologist to say, I do not believe what you're saying. But once you get 10,000 feet or 20,000 feet, a couple of inches or a foot or two is, is you're still 99.9 something percent. D do I make my point? So you want to get long lengths that are connecting significant points as part of your data. You, I don't work with anything less than 99.5 percent if I can help it. If it doesn't reach up that, I lose interest very quickly. So let's have a look at the sites along this thing before we look at the lengths. These sites up here uh, were investigated during the 1970s by various groups who were based in, here in Glastonbury. There was Nigel Pennick and his wife Anne, and um, there was a, a, a Catherine Maltwood's book on the zodiac around here, and they firmly believed, Nigel Pennick and a few others, especially some Welsh people who were big in, in the Tafia back home, were purporting to reckon that Welsh legends, and you have to speak Welsh to really understand where they were coming from, that Welsh legends included a, a story of a, a big crucible uh, uh, in, in this area that was also a zodiac, although it's not called a zodiac, it's called a, it's called a, sky, te a sky temple or something. Um, and this was something that started me off uh, when I uh, got up on this site here because very quickly I started to be given or to recover data that was highly relevant to the study of stone circles and Stonehenge. It gave, this was a treat. 
the, they came to Glastonbury, the name of the outfit from here was the IGR, which was the international, pompous name really, International Geophysics Research. RILCO, the Research into Lost Knowledge Organisation, was also involved in doing some of this work. They were quite big at that time and published information in their big yellow brochures. You can still be lucky enough, you can get those in second-hand bookshops here. And I think I bought about three from a gentleman on the front bench there. Thank you, Gareth. Treasured possessions. Um, they, that, that was sort of mid-70s, late 70s. And so they came, and they were convinced they'd found on the landscape the shape of Capricorn, because there's a place called Goat Stream and the shape of a goat on the landscape, just to the left of the, the peak there. Uh, Crimmock is sort of here. Right. And then they found further west the shape of an archer, which is Sagittarius. Now, th that fits the midwinter thing because Sag Capricorn rules midwinter and the sign of Capricorn comes on a zodiac, a conventional zodiac has Sagittarius here and it, has, it would have Capricorn here. So I can't tell you how, oh, sorry, Sagittarius is this side. I'm, I'm, it's late in the day and, you know, forget, forget I'm, I'm getting old. But I, I, this subject's in good hands. I went to Simon's lecture this morning and I thought that was really good. So, well, well done, that was really good stuff. I, I, can, I can retire now. Um, th this is the Sagittarius and Capricorn, and it's in the right order. So that marks the winter solstice, if this zodiac is correct. You, you understand enough of what I'm saying. You might not be interested in astrology at all, but the zodiac is a fairly universal thing. So two points here. One is this is telling us, if this was the Sky Temple, that that is the winter solstice point on, the, on, a, on a, a, an astrological or an astronomical chart divided into 12. Sagittarius precedes it and Capricorn uh, is, it post, posts it. And so we, we've got something going there. The problem with these people was they got their zodiac the wrong way around and they put the center way south, uh, the other side of the Procellis. Uh, and if you put it the other, this side, then what happens is that you get, as we'll see now, these sites here, that's called the saddle in Welsh. Um, there is something about horses and uh, chevaux de frise, or Carn Alu, and the Carn Menin um, is nothing to do with horses. But the point is, there's something to do with horses and Sagittarius there and fighting and, and archery and stuff. And uh, You can make that up or you can, it might be real. And then you, on the Capricorn, you've got Goat Stream just in Crimmock. Now, they never, this work never really got completed. But this bit now has been completed because if we carry on around the ridge, we can start to look at other places. Like, this is where we've just been looking at. That's the top of the Karn Menin, that's the top pinnacle of, um, uh, of the Priscelli Bluestone site. Uh, and I'm stood on a intrepid, I think it's my knee maybe. My brother took the photograph um, a long time ago now. That's the Cairns, you can see that little lump on top of the Royal Dragon, that's there. There's the saddle looking like a sphinx or a lion, a reclining lion. And there's Vrenivaur, the big figurehead leading the ridge. So we're going around the ridge and you can see here that from that point there we're coming around some sort of curve around the Bluestone site and if we carry on, there's some good photos now, there's Bed Arthur, Arthur's grave, that's the, that's the other Sagittarian thing, the warrior uh, Arthur and uh, so there we've got the same thing as we're going around the curve now, there's Reniva, um, um, Royal Dragan, the three cairns. There's the Bluestone site is back there, that's Carn Alu, and this is Bed Arthur, and that's Midsummer Morning. Nice photo, isn't it? Thank you to my friend Heather Thomas for, for supplying that. And then we're going the other way now, back round, and we've, we've just left this, we just took the last photo looking that way, and then we come up to Royal Vethai, which is that little point there, and then the the highest point in the whole Purcell is Cum Kerwin, where King Arthur fought a battle in, in Welsh myth, the Battle of Tor Truth, which is about a wild boar coming from, a stinking boar coming from, I know plenty of those. <laughs> I expect we all do. You watch parliamentary question time, you, 
you'll get to meet those. Um, uh, there's Cum Kerwin, which is a, a really gripping place to stand when it's not cloudy. Now, I want to introduce you to Voyal Vela. It's an important site because this now, Bald Hill of Graves, is where more or less the sign of Scorpio would begin. And Scorpio is very much connected with death and resurrection. And the whole of this big cairn, which you can see as a, a sort of nipple on the top, the nipple is, is that, with me sat there with my binoculars, so I'm a bit of a tit on that one. Um, and then we've got, I, I, I'm, I'm all right with that, aren't I? Yeah, no one's going to, no one's going to sue me. And um, th there's the, uh, the sort of nipple, which is littered with pock marks of later cremations. Uh, and the top of the cairn has a, a vesica-shaped trench in it, which you can see down here at the bottom, which is really possibly a place where the bodies were laid out to be um, air burialed and stripped off with hawk, raptor birds. I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't speak with any authority on that. Come, ooh, come, ooh, ooh. Come, Kerwin is, ooh, God, these things. I'm not, not the delicate fingered person I was. There we are. That's the top of the Priscilla's there. So we've, we're going round there, we're going round the curve, and we start to do some measurements. And with a theodolite, that means that you triangulate on to the thing there. And we dis I discovered this thing that when I went home and, and looked at it, suddenly realised it was an equilateral triangle, a very accurate one. And I'm not messing about here, it's accurate to sort of, well, we'll see what the accuracy is. So the midwinter alignment that starts Capricorn then leads to a 60 degree back to Scorpio and in the middle of it we start Sagittarius and that more or less fits the mythology of these places in Welsh legend. Now that needs you to actually confirm because no one, it's only with talking with Welsh people that you get a picture of that. But the, the, all the Welsh history of this area is well recorded and there's some good translations available in English. Let's look at the lens here. We're talking about 18,745 feet to Voil Dragan. To, from Castell to Voil Feather, it's 18,531. And the, between the two of them, it's 18,573. Now, that isn't a, a bad slide, but it isn't actually what I ended up when I did a, a more accurate survey later on. I've actually got this to better than 99.3% by um, using a newer version of Google Earth, a professional version, and employing someone at the Ordnance Survey to have a quick deco on something they have. The point is that these angles are incredibly accurate. They're to within the bottom 60.79 is 0.79 over what it should be. The other two are about uh, half a degree less than they should be. So this is a pretty accurate I mean, we're talking four, three and a half miles for, for the length of the sides, and they're matched to within a few feet of each other, and that's the percentage. If you're not into maths, just, just listen to the, the rest of it. So then we'll, you go to Carningley Summit, and you find that it's the same length, very nearly the same length. And we're starting to go back round now uh, to, to the curve that goes round past Newport, and the River Nevin estuary. So we've got it, we, we're suggesting this is actually the spokes of a wheel that we, what we're drawing here. And then Lechadribeth, the monument I showed you before, which is visible, there it is, right on the top there, from Castell Mauer here. You can see that there, very clear as daylight, and that's the, a similar distance there, a fourth spoke. Good, isn't it? And what we'd, we're in, a cauldron-shaped landscape, with Castethmar at the beginning, and then finally Khan Menin, the bluestone site, forms a fifth spoke. And in fact, there are some two other sites that have been identified by not me, but by someone else who spent a lot of time. I think the right hand one, Penralt, there, is perhaps a little bit too long, it's out a bit too long the spoke. And Trafigin's summit is not visible from Casteth Mauer, but it's visible from Voil Vedai, and you can see Casteth Mauer directly underneath the line. That is the right length, it's perfect. So we, we, I'm suggesting to you we've got a circular form here. And we can call it the Priscelli wheel. We could call it the Priscelli zodiac. Now, whatever you think a zodiac is or isn't, and if you're an astrologer, it has a far different meaning than if you're an astronomer, 
What I would like to say to you now is probably more important than worrying about the astrology side of anything. All uh, maps of the sky have the 24-hour day on them because the Earth rotates. You're all happy with that. Yeah? Anyone got a problem with that? that it's a map of the sky and the sky rotates or appears to rotate every 24 hours. But it's also, if it's marked up in degrees, it marks the number of days in a year. Yeah? It can also mark the number of uh, days in, in a moon, go the moon going around the sky, which, you know, happens in one of the months, and every month. And so w this is inherently uh, possible to be a, the zodiac. We've got Capricorn here, th there. We've got Sagittarius here in the 30 degree bit, and then we've got the Hill of Graves here. And so you could go around and you could invent the new zodiac. I'm not going to do that. Someone else will do that. Got enough to do with this lot. Faced with this data and what it's saying. So I'm excited at this point, and I'm thinking, well, let's measure it. Let's do some sums. So what we do next, what I do, is that I don't want to, I don't like averaging numbers, but you have to if you've got miles of data, because to make it simple. But the combined average of this, the spokes is that figure there, 18,644 feet. Uh, it's a combination of two centres chosen on, on Casteth Mauer, one at the very centre of the monument, and another one at the highest ground on the central line. And uh, taking the average of that gives you of that one. These two are a bit less. And so we, we're, we're, we're talking about this area. Now remember that 18.6, if it changes to 18.7, it's one part in nearly 200. So you're up there at 99. 2%. Hello, what's that? Okay. Um, so let's move on. Spread of values, 99.4%. So let's move on. There's the mean circumference of the thing and mean diameter. The mean diameter, 37,291 feet, which is just over seven miles. And the mean circumference is 117,152 feet. What is the reality of this? The question I have to ask, and it's hard to do it when you've got a microphone in both sides of your mouth at the same time and you've been told not to move your head very much. Because I want to go over there and go, mm, and, and wave my arms. There, was a, there is a radio mic if you want to do that. Well, I've got it on, but he's using it for the film. Yeah, no, no, it's, we'll, 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 let me moan. <laughs> It sometimes does me a lot of good. Um, not always. So there we are. Now, we, do we believe that this is a reality, or is it just a coincidence that the central point of Casteth Mauer is truly central? It's extremely central to this arrangement here. Uh, I, these, these dots are not drawn conveniently. They're drawn as near as I can get it to the actual point, and the circle is then added to it. And so we, we are talking... Uh, pretty accurate. The, the, perhaps the worst of them, or the one that's least accurate, is that one up there. But the point is that we've got some figures here. We've got that many feet, that many, uh, the mean diameter. I could give it you in megalithic yards, or pygmies, or paces, or whatever you wanted. But the point is I work in feet. And what I did do next was, you ask is it a zodiac. So what we're doing, we're going to expect the rim to have something to do with the solar year. And it's true, and you don't have to go wade through all the maths. You can buy the book at the end of the a weekend there, where you'll find that the, uh, in feet, that number is very interesting because it's four times the solar year times the lunar month in megalithic yards. I've gone out of feet now. But it's four solar years times the lunar month in megalithic yards. And I didn't fudge that, because I didn't invent that. That was put together as a set of a presumption amounting to a certainty by Alexander Tom, who a mere mention will clear any academic common room in archaeology. <laughs> um, so it's a zodiac, all right. And it does the sun and the moon. Isn't that interesting? But it does four of them, four times. So it's interesting that we read with the, the rotating castle in, in Welsh myth, Caer Sidi, and Sidi is a Welsh word whose the root means revolving or a spindle or a hub or a wheel. 
It's, it's the root word for turning and, and revolving. And, Am I not a candidate for fame to be heard in the song at Caer Pedrivan, four times revolving? The first word from the cauldron when it was spoken by the breath of nine damsons, it is gently warmed. Is not the cauldron of the chief of Anun, that's the bloke who is in the underworld there, he's the one with the pitchfork, in its fashion with a ridge around its edge of pearl, edge of pearls, a rim, a ridge around, this is a ridge and its edge of pearls are the monuments, the dolmens, the cairns, the uh, natural features. And so we've, we've got there, we could now start saying to ourselves, well, is this something like what we're seeing there? Is the word Pedrivan rather like Pentrivan, which is our major dolmen there? Uh, there's a, a number of things about this that ring, ring true to this wheel-like thing. And it's, it's in Taliesin's poem. So is it connected to Stonehenge? Are we in fact seeing one of the wheel, either the Sarsen or the Aubrey Circle? I mean, it's, they're the only two big true circles in the whole monument. So we'll have a look. Well, the Puselli circumference is 117,152 feet. I've done that. We've got it in megalithic yards. So we've tr tr translated it back into what that actually is, so it's almost exactly the same number. And then the Aubrey wheel is 898.8 .8 feet. The outer diameter of the Aubrey circumference, if you put rope round it, that's the holes with a rope going round what was in the holes, is 898 feet. The scaling factor is 130.4. That's so disappointing. I mean, it, what's that? It doesn't say anything, does it? But in fact, it does, says everything because it's four times uh, four times the, um, uh, the lunar, uh, uh, go on, I'm tired, right, it's four times 32.585, the in, which is the megalithic yard in inches. Now, I know I'm shifting units, but I'm quite legitimate to say that, because I, I've been working, whatever you do, the ratio is going to be the same, whatever units you measure in. And so what I'm saying to you is that we've got this outer wheel that, with it is 130.4 times bigger than the Aubrey circumference, and the Aubrey circumference is the end of that equation. The Aubrey circumference is four times that, but in inches rather than in megalithic yards, 32.585. So we've now got solar year times lunar month in the Aubrey one, and that's what it is, because we'll have a look at that. There's the Aubrey circle. Uh, dimension, if you multiply the solar year by the lunar month, it's, it's that number of inches. If it's in inches, you can do it in any measurement you like, but the point is, it's going to be that 10,785.5 of them. And in this case, it's in inches. And 130.34 is four times 32.585, which is the value of the megalithic yard expressed in inches. So the Priscelli wheel has the same diameter, same perimeter, multiplied by that. We're on with a lot of data that's been said before, a lot of evidence that's been considered before, and we're now saying Stonehenge appears, or is suggesting, I'm suggesting to you, it's shown to be astronomically, connect, geodetically, and meteorologically linked to the locations of the Priscelli Rim megaliths and their landscape. So it's a, it's a temple with a, a huge landscape temple whose circumference is telling us things about the units of length being used, which we already knew the unit of length, but we've never seen it used in this way before. And so the Aubrey Circle is a miniature copy of the earlier Priscelli wheel. So the, my, that means that, could we say, that Stonehenge, which was built much later than all these monuments and this activity going on in Priscelli, which started around 4,500 BC, certainly 4,000 it was all up and running, that uh, 1,500 years later, a miniature of this is built on Salisbury Plain. And the next question must be, might there have been an equivalent Sarsen circle centred on Castellamour that has a radius of, well, it's about 6,800 feet? Well, I've got friends in the area that we all went out and we walked it and combed it and had a look round. And the ongoing search revealed useful evidence. Let's have a look at the sites that are there. First one is our local, the big monument of the Priscellis is Pentrivan. It's an unusual view of it. 
they saw one view at the beginning of the slide display. And we're talking about the sarsen ring here, which is this one. There. And that, that monument is exactly 6,800 and something from Casteth Mauer. The other site is this, uh, well, Coughlin, the writer, the ar academic archaeologist said it was a Norman fort, but it's a very prominent site in a village, unpronounceable village called Egelzuru, which has three W's in it. And were there to be three W's in a Scrabble set, you would score an awful lot for the way, word Egelzuru on a triple word score. Uh, okay, you try, try it at home. So there's the, there's the moat, and that's also 6,800 8, 6, feet from Casteth Mauer. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, now there are other sites in process at the moment. I haven't had uh, much uh, success because the weather's been terrible over our last winter, quite the worst I've ever met, but it's now looking like the land's drying out enough for me to go and investigate at least four other sites that may be part of that inner sanctum. Now you can see examples of both the inner proposed inner circle and the outer circle with the two main dolmens in, the, in this structure. The two main dolmens are Pentrivan there, which is sat taken from Casteth Mauer, that's the view from Casteth Mauer, and there's Lekedribeth, uh, which is the outer circle. The or that's the Albury circle perimeter marked, and that's the inner circle marked. And so we can say that we have a replica of Stonehenge by its principal monuments uh, in the area, uh, and some natural features, and the shape of the ridge. So I put it to you, my lords and ladies, that we have here the original Stonehenge in Wales, and anyone is welcome to come and check all these figures out, and I would be actively able to guide them to the right thing. So here's what I'd like to make as a statement here. This research has revealed important aspects of our cultural past that currently can't be found in any of our history books. Strange, isn't it? The remnants of it appear in Welsh legends and folklore. Might this have something to do with a society that has been encouraged to ignore its real past, substituting in its place something that makes our present culture look rather better than it is actually? <laughs> Are we culturally in denial of a real heritage and to roots that go much further back, way back, than the Egyptian, Assyrian, Minoan, Greek and Roman cultures to before 3,500 BC? Discuss at length and you've got the rest of the weekend to discuss with other members here. Um, now, I've got one or two comments to make. I'm looking at the time now, and I'm realising that it's, uh, the egg timer is dwindling very quick. But I want to make some comments this morning that throughout Simon's lecture, uh, there was a, a, a dull grunt of approval every time archaeologists were slighted or, uh, or, or, vindic or accused of various cardinal sins, but the point is that's no way forward for us. As a group, we have to get on. Now, and I've said this at lots of venues, but I've not said it at Megalithomania. Over my checkered 40-year career of being involved in lay hunters, UFOs, crop circles, astrology, uh, uh, anyone who has a theory in this subject and is criticised for it immediately wants to either sue the person and get all really very profoundly upset but doesn't want to communicate or debate in an ordered manner such that we can, decisions can be taken. This is a human problem, it's not just this subject, but it's, I mean, it's particularly true with religion, isn't it? Anything that emotionally affects us, which this subject, I guess, does, you wouldn't be here otherwise, or maybe you would, but it affects us emotionally, you don't like to have your cherished ideas picked at. I, would, I have got to the point now where I really would desperately like some people to come down to the Bruxelles and, and have a look at this. We need to work together with archaeologists. I mean, we, I'm really grateful that Mike Parker Pearson is coming here and finding out where the blue stones from Stonehenge came from, even though it's not directly important to me. The fact is that he's raising the presence of this area archaeologically by being here because he's no doubt the top media presenter of archaeology in Britain now. We, we can dismiss Baldrick, I think, in that regard, uh, and, and one or two of the others, but uh, and, and Torville and Dean are not really where it's at anymore, and, and Geoffrey Wainwright, bless him, has, has passed on. But the point is, here's my top tip, and as a group, I, can I recommend that this is a, something that you, and uh, we ought to work together 
there's me and Mike Parker business. We're not enemies. We don't, we don't, he doesn't agree with anything I'm doing, I don't think. And, but I'm quite happy to support what he's doing. I'm standing on top of one of the big megaliths that they unravelled. That bucket, I'm not sure it was in it, but I've got a good idea. And I know where it's going when I've gone. <laughs> uh, but there we are. We are able to have a discourse about it. Now, I owe this man nothing. He hasn't done my career any good in the academic establishment. Uh, and neither did his, one of his colleagues, Clive Ruggles. But I'm now 70. I was 70 last Tuesday. You can clap because that's what happens on TV programs. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to take a back seat a little bit more now. I've got two more books I want to write, and I run a small holding, and I love doing that. And I've got four grandchildren, and I don't need to tell you what that entails. And I am actually now going to start backing off from this. There's, there's loads of stuff I've done, and it needs someone else to check it through. And th that's available, and I'll help anyone who wants to do that. But I, working together is going to have to be one of the solutions here. Because if we're going to crack this thing, we're not going to do it by always fighting or criticising or moaning. They've, they have, Aubrey Bill has written to me a letter saying that this, that archaeologists are, are guilty of willful prejudice in this subject. And he used to be one, and he's probably the doyen of stone circles of, of his generation. And so willful prejudice must not be allowed and, uh, or must be not encouraged. So that's just a little rant I've had. Get on. Don't, if someone has a theory and you don't like it, find out what it's doing to you. Why do you react badly to someone having this theory? Does it, do, do you have a cherished theory that it doesn't fit? I don't really, I'm not going to sleep any less well if people don't accept this model, but I think it's a very good bit of new evidence that the Priscellis, which we know is where the bluestones came from, which were there first on the site, were taken there to Stonehenge in order to uh, were replicated as, as, a, as a, a monument for the Wessex kings at a later date. There's a book. There's always a book in there. The book is Temple of the, in the Hills. It's a very understated book. New insight into prehistoric cosmology. I mean, it's, what's, what, a, what a weak title that is. The full story of this discovery is now available in a fully illustrated book. It's nicely illustrated. They're, at the get, they're, they're out there. If you're interested, get one and I'll sign it. Uh, or you won't if you don't want. If you want to burn it, I'll also... <laughs> wa 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 if, you're the, the, if you're the fathers of this uh, esteemed business, then if you want to burn it, then I'll, I'll perhaps add a couple of free ones to help you. Um, OK, I've written 11 books, and this is the last one at the, the moment. And there's a load of other stuff I could go into. But one of the things I want to also show you, I want to remind you about, Boom, boom, boom. Is I started 33 years ago, when in 1988 I suddenly saw how a Pythagorean triangle could enable you to integrate the solar and lunar months to make a viable calendar. And this was done by, I'm not saying it's this one particularly that came first, but this is certainly an interesting connection. This is a geometric connection between Stonehenge and the Bluestone site. There's the Bluestone site. It's within a mile and a half of there. This hill's being taken down for mining. It's just outside the National Park, and they're taking the whole top of the hill down. But I went up there with John Michel, and he said it, that was the most interesting, when we were doing the Book of Al the Measure of Albion. And we had a, an amazing experience up there. It was a very, very powerful place. Overlooks the Bluestone site. Stonehenge is there, and then go directly west along the same line of latitude and you're going to come to the middle of Lundy Island which is named after Helen or Ellen which is if you read Monsieur Billcliffe is one of the names of, of Bridget the Bil Bil Bilinus and Bridget and so if you draw this line at the middle at the three two point this is the two and the three of the doors and the Masonic temples and all that the two, thir the two to three point that goes to Colley Island. The oldest, one of the oldest churches in Wales is on Colley Island, and it's, it had um, um, co-educational facilities there. Heaven knows what they were, but they were co-educational. So we don't know anything much about that. But that shape there enables you to take the 12 lunar months, which is 354 days and a third. This is the lunar, lunar year. That's 13 lunar months, which is 383.898 days. 
So we've got that there, 12 lunar months, 13. And somewhere along this third axis, you, so many of you will have seen this before, you might even be fed up of hearing about it. But that point there gives you 12.368, which is the number of lunar months in a solar year. So you make this triangle, extract that point there and make that, that represents the solar year compared to the lunar year. Slide those next to each other and you've got a calendar that puts the moons in the right place and, and will t can even be used to calibrate eclipses. It's another story. So if you have an Aubrey circle clock, you can do an awful lot of that. But with this one, you can just do it with ropes and strings and you can go to the cursors at Stonehenge and lay them all out end on end and find out about astro astronomy going on into the years ahead. Now, this is perfectly feasible as a Stone Age technology. We, we will never know quite whether it was done or not, but I'm going to produce more evidence tomorrow with the John Michel lecture. There's one I've discovered in the Priscilla's. This is the subject of the book Protus Stonehenge in Wales because I found a, a 5, 12, 13 triangle to Carningley Kriegai Chemais, which is three dolmens uh, in a row. It's not Voildrigan, but it's uh, a very famous, a well-known site. And there's Lech Adribeth Dolmen, which we saw earlier. And there's a 5, 12, 13 triangle. And the side of this length, the 12 side, is very significant because the unit length of this triangle, if you take, divide the length by 12, is 23148 feet divided by 12 is 1929 feet. If you divide that by the megalithic fathom, which is two megalithic yards, it's exactly one lunar year in days. So in fact, along that line, which we've suggested is to do with the 12 lunar months, we find each unit represents in days, in, sorry, in megalithic uh, fathoms, um, 708 point something days. Also, this triangle has a 3-2 point marked on the landscape there by uh, one stone here, which makes an exact 3-4-5 triangle, establishing this 3-2 point geometrically. That's a big famous stone, Trevoil stone. They've all been digging it up. You look it up on the web. It's got cut marks and ring marks all over it. It looks like the fascia of a spaceship. And so there's the unit length, 1929. If you divide that by five, double the megalithic yard, 5.4432 feet, then you will get 708.5 or 0.6 um, uh, megalithic fathoms, which is um, one, one, one lunar year. In megalithic fathoms. You're all happy with that? So it's quite exciting. Now I think we, we started with Casteth Mauer and we've ended up looking at 5, 12, 13 triangles. But that, is, uh, that was already here and has been there since the 80s and I've not had one person take it apart in a magazine, I've not had one letter, I've had no archaeological de debate about it and you know I've been up there, I've visited Lundy Island with John Michel and a group of people I've taken People are, you know, and lots of people have walked bits of it. There's a basis of a book about what goes on somewhere here, along this middle bit in the valleys uh, in Wales. And that is a very accurate geodetic form. Tomorrow we'll see how that is related to other large geodetic forms on the landscape when we look at John Michel's life in regard to, to geodetic structures and the idea of the old straight track. So I'm going to finish five to five now. You've probably all had enough. So for this first lecture, I want you to go away with the idea that there is possibly an analogue model of Stonehenge in the very landscape itself, which doesn't involve very much moving or heavy hardware, certainly not 50-ton megaliths. Um, the biggest megalith is the capstone of Lekka Dribeth, which is probably about 30 tonnes. Um, but the other megaliths in involved in this structure are not that that big Pentreven has a big capstone, um, and and I can recommend this area as a, an enchanted place where there is so much needs to be done. And I'm not going to get if I have three lifetimes end on end, I'm not going to get through all of them. So welcome to Wales. I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much.